unmute myself here. Okay, here we go. All right. Okay, welcome back to the live part after an hour or so. Um, I think we have plenty to discuss and we already discussed plenty in the Slack channel. So where do we want to start? I think maybe as a, as a first part, I would like to just throw out that in this, in this uh, segment, we are trying to optimize for multiple personas, right? We have the hardcore HPC performance nerds who want to be in control of every flag. And we have scientists who do not care about the specifics and they want, might want to do some um, abstraction like like HPC CC, CM or the Conda piece that we saw where they don't need to define all the nitty gritty details, but just throw in this is what I need and then we create an image or like to a certain degree, of course, as well, spec and easy build. So <clears throat> question is, can we make everyone happy someday? Can I have my wish of um, having a Docker file, for instance, that blows out everything? Can we make everyone happy with one shot? And this, of course, I, I'm, I'm emb embracing for impact that it's not possible in the near future, but who wants to start? Kenneth. Should I kick it off? Okay. Um, can we make everybody happy? Maybe, but it's certainly not going to come for free. We'll have to put in some effort. Um, so if you want to get a container image that's properly optimized for your CPU architecture or GPUs, or maybe the combination of both, then somebody will have to build that container image. It's not going to come out of thin air. Um, so if you want to build for every possible CPU architecture out there, which is Intel, AMD, and even ARM and power, and soon even RISC-V, and combine that with GPUs and maybe a couple of different um, network interconnects, you're in trouble quite soon. So it, there's basically too many combinations. Um, but maybe you can do something in between where you build for a couple of common architectures, and then you leverage a library like Archpack, for example, that picks the best match for your system which is certainly already a lot better than just running a generic container because that's the only one that's there. Now, making all this magic happen is not going to come for free. Um, it will, there will have to be support in the runtime um, for making this proper selection of the container image based on the host. Um, somebody will have to build this range and decide which kind of range um, has to be provided and so on. But I don't think it's impossible. Okay, who wants to go next? CJ. Ah. Or oh, Greg. I want to cut short on talking about Kubernetes because this can be addressed tomorrow. Uh, but I do feel that orchestrating the builds is a good way to, to like the next step for me. And uh, like I agree fully with easy build and spec. Like I'm a super fan of those tools. But I do feel that we need to orchestrate how to use them and that users should not be building containers. Like I, I really feel that we should be leveraging SPAC easy build to create these Docker files, scripts, or whatever you like uh, to name them, them, and then just orchestrate where you want to build your images. And there's a good trend in the chat talking about like labeling the nodes. And as Kenneth was saying, like this will come out of a price, right? So if we can orchestrate, okay, I wanna build this container for these three different architectures or these three different GPUs that I have. So I do feel that we should be speaking about con uh, building our containers via SPAC or easy build and then orchestrating those builds, but not doing that manually. So you're voting for CI/CD? Uh, I'm not saying CI/CD really. Like this could be a manual process, like using kubectl and stuff like that. But I do feel that the next step after uh, easy build and SPAC is how to orchestrate easy build and SPAC, and that way we will be able to have a better 
compile, if we can say compile images. I guess I could come in a little bit. I think um, the people in this community, I think, have done a lot of work to innovate and to create options. And I think people are still trying to figure out, so out of the many things that I could do, which are the best available options? And there's kind of a slider, if you, sliding scale, if you will, between um, uh, how much people know about and whether they're aware of some of the of those available technologies and whether they want something for ease of use or whether they want something uh, that's, for example, going to have the smallest container. So uh, I think it's we already know and uh, have demonstrated that it's possible to build a single container uh, that can have be sort of a fat container, if you will, that has uh, support for many different target architectures in it, and uh, that you can have a single entry point to the container and have it go look uh, and query uh, variables that are, uh, you know, state that's in the host machine and pick uh, which of those, you know, where it's going to branch from that single entry point and use the appropriate technology. Um, or uh, deal with a lot of the different customizations that people are trying to do. Um, so we know that that's out there uh, and can be an alternative to having a single, I mean, a set of simpler containers, each of which are well tuned to the particular conditions of the host machine, whether it's for a target architecture or what the satisfied dependencies are for the host machine, et cetera. Um, I think you can also have a choice of uh, many of the, the build systems were uh, kind of set up uh, assuming that you would be able to share uh, common layers and, and common infrastructure across lots of different users, um, and uh, whereas you can't really share across containers. And so uh, there are options for being able to specialize the containers so that you can uh, you know, get just what you want and everything you want in that without having to uh, sort of rely so much on uh, what's in the underlying container. And in particular, when you use systems like HPCM or others that can do multi-stage builds, um, you can do a lot to reduce the size. So I can say more about that, but um, I'll let it yield to others here. Yeah, maybe I, I want to double click on what you just said. And, and we also had this in the channel do we want to have one big container that can rule them all because we have a fat binary or we have a runtime decision that it's made to be to pick up the the image or the, the the binary that is the best for the current architecture or do we want to go in a direction and that's um, biased uh, but i would like to see us going in this direction that we make a runtime problem a build problem and a distribute problem so that we create images for multiple architectures, multiple permutations, multiple configurations, and then have it been either distributed or make it a distributing problem so that we choose the right image to serve to a certain runtime or make the runtime pick the correct image. Um, I think that would be desirable from my point of view, because if we have this big fat binary and we have an, a container that can run everything, then if you have a new architecture that is added to your cluster or added to your environment, then you need to rebuild all the containers, right? So you need, you cannot just create an extra container that serves a new architecture. You need to rebuild the container from scratch for everyone, right? Or am I mistaken there? No, that, that's exactly one of the points I, I have with fat binaries. I mean, you can only build for the architectures you know or care about, and maybe next week something new pops up that you should be caring about as well, then you have to rebuild the whole thing. And, and start over again. Um, so that's certainly one of the issues. And you can say, yeah, I want to build a fat container that supports multiple things. But if the multiple things are a thousand different things, then that's not, that's not going to work either. Yeah, one thing to add to that would be uh, the more runtime options we add, um, what we're sacrificing is also repeatability. We, we may have runtime bugs. Um, that affect the repeatability of the, the code that we are running. So I would like to rely on the runtime switches as to, as little as possible. I'd like to limit them so there are that can be made. But on the side here, I think as well, like to 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 support what CJ was saying is, I mean, and and no one has more, uh, I think, 
experience than NVIDIA when it comes to or to this like host dependencies and how to solve this. And that's why you came up with Runtime or with NVIDIA Run and with NVIDIA Docker, I think. I mean, what works is king, right? If we if we cannot agree on a runtime thing, if we cannot agree on a distribution scheme, then kind of that's the last resort, right? Having a fat container as well. So that's well the, to pre patch into the future, it also suggests that we uh, standardize the way we deal with uh, devices, and we'll talk about that, that a little bit on Thursday for sort of managing devices through that. But I think uh, there's some good prospects ahead for that. Yeah, and also to to restate what what Lucas said last time that if well, we need a, a good default for something to work, and then we can optimize on this, right? So if if the containers only run once, then maybe we don't need to optimize it so much. Maybe we can have a fat binary, or we can have a binary just don't work, just that just works. But if we realize that the containers run like hundreds of times, then we might want to to optimize this container. But yeah, that's. Well, I guess I might turn this question around a little bit, um, and it it's. Uh, I'd like to maybe put a stake in the ground and say uh, that there are an awful lot of people who will run a given container on a given kind of platform. It's possible that that same user may run the same kind of container on different platforms, but whenever they're running it in a given run, it's going to be in one place on one platform. So what are the obstacles for an admin being able to say, ah, you just requested this container on that platform and being able to choose the correct and matching container for being able to run on that platform if it's been made available. And why? what are the particular advantages uh, to being able to have one, platform, one container that will run on seven different platforms, knowing full well that next week there are going to be eight different platforms to run on, uh, to your point, Kenneth, and, and it doesn't run there. Is that really a satisfactory solution? What are the key benefits to having that sort of um, uh, multiple personality container in that way that can't be solved through uh, by an, an appropriate use on a given system uh, working appropriately with the, the system administrator? CJ, there is one um, I will volunteer, which is um, in in certain cases when we would like to run the same let's say similar containers in multiple uh, public clouds, we may, we may want to generate those um, multiple container images so that we can test them and ensure their viability on those platforms before we put it in front of a user. So we, we tend to build multiple container images and, and test them out before we ship. Can so you finish in that terms thought? of the- Clearly the you need to validate for all of those targets, yes. Why does that need to be done as one container that's that's exercised or validated in say three different ways as opposed to three different containers? I'm just playing devil's advocate, so I'm, I'm encouraging you on behalf of the audience. So to, I guess I, I have a use case for this. Do you guys? Yeah, can you hear me? I'm. I just joined. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. I, I mean, one reason that you would want to use the you would have want to have the containers associated is like if if you wanted to use a different architecture on a cloud, right? I mean, like, there's you've just gotten ARM nodes in the cloud, and all the people running JavaScript are having a real easy time taking their container and making it work for ARM. But the folks who are running HPC have a much harder time because they have to have you know a native version of the code. So, like, I, I don't think that we need to have giant fat containers, but I do think you know, like, I, I think it was Eduardo or or someone said, it's very useful to have one name for a container built for different architectures. So that you can basically take the same workflow and run it on two different clouds or two different instance types, and compare how much it costs, right? Or you know, in our case, you can it's a have like four kinds of machines. So you can so, do that with so one I'm name familiar or with and use text. Yeah. So there are there are multiple users and people that have been thinking about this and approaching it from. And I know Eduardo said he you know wasn't looking at this from the the CI CD platform um, perspective, but. DevOps pipelines is really designed for this sort of a thing, right? You're not only building, you can build for multiple architectures, but then you can also do the validation for them in a, in a very automated and streamlined and fast way, and then bring these into production. This is, this is kind of, 
you know, in my mind, exactly what we're talking about, but it also now starts to get into the, 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 the orchestrate side. And, and I think that there's a, a correlation between when you're building an image, you need to tag that image. You need to annotate that image in such a way that you know where this image needs to go. I don't think putting the onus of this on scientists, users, researchers, and whatnot is a good thing. This needs to be done in an automated way, whether that is through the build process and building that container and then annotating the container properly, or whether this is through a DevOps pipeline that's going to build that appropriately and then orchestrate out of there. So, But the problem there is... Build, build it or deploy it properly. Isn't that another option? Maybe that's what you meant. I think both, right? You have to build yeah. it properly and you have to deploy it properly. And the, the, the question, isn't the question that like building it properly, you need to be on this machine that you want to build for? It's hard to cross compile for another target. I mean, uh, this is why the onus can't be on the users in my take. This is why it has to come out of a pipeline in some way, shape or form. A DevOps pipeline and DevOps infrastructure, I think, would be ideal for this. You can build ARM, you can build uh, x86, you can build power. Of course, not all containers are going to build appropriately on each one of these architectures, so you have to make sure that you're validating accordingly. So isn't the user story something like, uh, as an end user, I want a named uh, container to be able to work on as many as possible, hopefully all platforms that I want to run on, and I want a service uh, where I can just say, run this for me, please, on this platform, and it'll go find the right version and make it go. The implementation could be up to either the developer or you know anybody in between there and the administrator. I'm with you. Um, the, but the question is, who is doing this decision, right? It's currently if you have a fat binary or if you have a container that has multiple binaries, it's a runtime decision of the container of the entity script as a container. It could also be a runtime decision of the runtime, like fetching the correct container, but for this the container runtime needs to make sure that it can reach the, the, the registry or can make sure that it gets the right container. It can also be a transparent thing that uh, the, the registry does, like serving the correct container without the, uh, without the runtime even knowing that it has it gets hand, handed down a, a container that uh, it, it has asked for. I mean, there are multiple ways of dealing with this, right? I, I would suggest that this is not the job of the container runtime. This is the job of the orchestration system. No, I agree. I think it's it should be the registry, in my opinion, but that's, that's my current state of thought. Do you think the registry should decide what, uh, which version of a container is good for the user? I kind of think, like, I mean, you could do either, right? Like, you could ask a registry to, to suggest the best versions of a container for your particular platform. But I think ultimately, like, the user should be able to decide, you know, I want this image if they really, really want this image. But, yeah, I mean, you could do that. You could do the optimization client or server side. Yeah. Okay. Um, and and I, I had one more. I had one more reply to CJ's question, like, why don't people work together with the system administrators of the HPC system to try and get a properly optimized image? It's the sysadmins don't have time. There's ten thousand users and there's ten sysadmins. That that doesn't work. Yeah, I think that's an important thing for the container world to start thinking about, right? Like, I mean, the container world started in rootland. With, with Docker, and, and I, I don't think things, it's not sustainable to have an HPC platform where everything requires root, because you, you, cause exactly that reason, you have to work with administrators, you have to be trusted, everything has to be do doable, unprivileged, if you want this to scale. Clearly. Okay, that's true. So, so can it maybe, as a, as a follow-up, maybe we as a community should double click into what remaining gaps are there at the, orchestration level for being able to be able to offer, as you said, Todd, you know, here's a default, you can use the default or you can override it with some specific version if you want and make that so that there's no 
need, there's an easy unwrap, there's no hard need or requirement for either input from the user or the administrator in order to be able to make that work. That there's something that works okay most of the time and you can override it if you wish. Yeah. I'll figure out what the uh, gaps are. What I, I mean, the other gap is is things like, so I mean, there's, one of the biggest gaps I see is, is the ability to assess compatibility, <laughs> right? Like, it, 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 and there's a compatibility question, there's an optimization question. Like, so if you if I'm gonna pull a container, right, uh, there's some ABI that I have to care about um, between it and my platform. And so the instruction set is one thing, right? Like, if I don't have a processor that can run the instructions in the container, that's a problem. So I wanna pick the best instruction set for the container. There's also, like you said, the interface between the container and the hardware. And so, you know, if you if, if you use the trick that we like to use, which in, in, in HPC sites, which is like bind mounting, it's not the most well-defined interface, right? You're essentially picking a library to be your ABI. And people will pick like MPI, they'll try to run their old containers on a new system with a newer glibc, and they'll bind mount an MPI that's linked to a newer glibc than what they have in the container. And so like right now, I think one of the gaps is I can't take a container and tell you if it's going to run on my machine, right? Because I don't know what libraries that container depends on when I bind mount something in, right? Or whether the ones in the container are compatible with the ones on the system. And so like clear interfaces is one way to solve that, like CJ was saying, where you definitely you define rigorously the interface between the container and the hardware. But I, I don't know that that's always Yeah, that's possible. only part of the solution, right? Yeah. I agree with you. And, and well, then this, this the, notion the other... that you're, at, you're getting it, can I just add something there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that notion of what you're talking about of having the container and its its dependencies, including the, the what it needs out of the underlying host platform that may not be obviously discoverable and that might only be discovered after it's been running for a week, which is half of its total runtime. Um, there's no existing standard for that. That kind of came up exactly. as one of the very first issues that we talked about in the HPC Containers Advisory Council. Yep. There's no standard for that. But we're, well, we're getting it's, it's more than that though. So it's, it's it's actually it's more than just what you're saying. Like so, it's it's not the the issue with the bind mount trick, right? And with anything where you're taking a library from the host and putting it in the container, is that now it's not just the requirements of the container; it's the requirements of what you bind mounted, right? So like the bind mount in this in the scenario I where see. I've seen this break, the bind mounted thing requires a newer glibc than what's in the container, and so yeah. Thought that we 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 discussed this in the runtime piece. Um, ah, like, okay or like this uh, OCI hooks for MPI, for GDPC and so on. So let's let's move on to something else. Um, I really like this Dockerfile front end piece, but I'm, I'm, I'm a fanboy, I admit. Um, but I think like with Podman, and I think Valentin is not in, right? But um, there are other ways of, of dealing with this in, in, in other built um, it builds build tools, right? So if you have an SSH connection you want to do, or if you have a, a secret you need to, to chime into your build, how do you guys deal with that with maybe Singularity build or, or others? And that's a hard cut, sorry for that. I didn't exactly follow the question. No, we we heard from 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 uh, Nicolas about the Dockerfile front ends, this experimental one where you can put in a cache, where you can put in a secret um, to your build process that is not part of the container runtime, uh, container file system. Sorry. So if you if you have an apt get cache or if you have another cache that you don't want to put into a file system layer, um, it's something I really like about the Dockerfile front end pieces, and I think for Singularity for builder, you deal with it by doing it on the host and then adding just the compiled files in the container or what is what is the ways of dealing with this? How you can you keep a a cache that is hot between different builds or different steps within the build that is not part of the container? So from the singularity perspective, we're always trying to do things in as reproducible way as absolutely possible. So if it's not defined within the the recipe, we, we tend to not want to encourage utilization of it. So for example, we've we've under multiple times we've had discussions about do we allow bind mounts uh, in a build? You know, do we allow environment variables to transcend uh, from the from the the host space into the container space during build? 
and we always come back to no, we want to limit that as much as absolutely possible. And again, the idea is around reproducible builds. Um, I'm still, I'm not extraordinarily familiar with the feature that you're specifically talking about. So I don't know if I'm answering it accordingly, but uh, from my perspective, uh, we try to focus everything that the recipe is the standalone de facto kind of piece you need to rebuild that container. And if there's anything external that you need as a result of it, that wouldn't necessarily be reproducible. Now, with that being said, can, uh, recipes themselves are not reproducible, right? They're usually a function of time. Um, you lose reproducibility. So you you kind of, it, it, it's more like, it ends up being used initially as as something that is the the definitive you know kind of build structure for what's inside that container, but later it just gets used as a as a point of reference or or something to uh, to leverage and modify and expand upon, but it ends up not always being 100% reproducible as a lot of times it's it's quoted to be. Yeah, I uh, totally agree that that uh, reproducibility is really really important. So when uh, when listening to the a builder talk. Uh, I was uh, I was really intrigued by the idea of being able to execute multiple things in in a nice readable way and then committing that to an image. But what I must say, what I didn't like was the, the part that it's possible to do stuff on the host and then import that to the image because um, you you lose the reproducibility at that point because you rely on the host and you don't have control over the environment of the host. So that would be something that I would like to do in another image because then you have control of what's inside the image. And um, like Greg just said, it's it's not 100% uh, reproducible because it changes over time, but it gives you at least uh, a way to do it again and again with a few minor changes like, um, let's say, updated packages, uh, fixed security holes and that kind of stuff. Yeah, so I specifically choose that example because Intel compilers. So you cannot give Intel compilers to developers to researchers, right? So sometimes you need to use these proprietary non-open source compilers, and it's really hard to get them. Oh, we just dropped. Oh, here we go. It's back. Yeah, sorry. And you start walking into licensing issues land that you don't want to. So the best way to avoid that is really to use a host to compile those and then get into the container. And you can do that with Builder and also with Singularity. So with Singularity, I, I, Greg didn't demo it that or show it that today, but there is a setup, a stanza for the Singularity build that you can do things on the host before actually starting the build. So it really shows you that both on Singularity and OCI ways, it is important to use these proprietary compilers before starting to build your container. And this is really a open source versus proprietary software discussion, but this is why we do it, right? Like this is why Builda and this is why Singularity has these before steps, so you can use things and not step with lawyer conversations, right? So that, that's why it is important to have these steps. More lawyer's conversation always fun in this panel, I think. But yeah, no, I haven't thought it this way already. I want to, I want to think about it longer now? Maybe not, I don't know. Um, yeah, but you're right. I mean, for this use case, I guess it's, uh, it's fair. Or do, has anyone a solution to not talk to lawyers about this. I guess not, or maybe. I, right. If I could just comment, I, I mentioned it in Slack, but um, you know, we do, we have some recipes at NERSC of how to use Intel compilers as part of the build process. And so it does require the user to kind of like wire up the um, license manager access, which is tedious, but it, it does work. It's just, um, it would be nice if it was more straightforward. I blame I think the someone just currently, commercial vendors. Yeah. I thought they had some kind of policy where you could use the Intel compilers in a CI environment if you talk to them or, or something. Does that still require the license manager? I, I'm not sure if there's some way to to work around it. I haven't. I'm not aware of anything. Okay. That requires you to read the user license agreement, which none of us ever want to do. 
Yeah, I mean, they do have, well, yeah, it, it won't help you with getting the compiler into the container, but they do have like a distributable libraries page. So you can at least take the artifact and distribute it. Well, I, yeah, there, a lot of folks will have uh, one part that's redistributable and one part that's not. And uh, for the part that's not, you kind of usually need to sign a EULA. And so it's the end user uh, or their sysadmin or whatever that needs to sign that. And so you can get that on the host, and then you have to design the uh, container so that you can grab whatever licenses or whatever you need from the host. And that's been done. I think the Summit guys are trying to work through that for Spectrum MPI right now, too. OK. Do you know what would be interesting after that? Like, now that we can build Docker files with EC Build and SPAC, and you can define to EC Build and SPAC that you want to use a proprietary compiler, how will that be translated into the end Docker file, like the output? So Ooh. this is a problem. There's oh, go ahead. It, it, yeah. No, no. I was going to finish yeah. with the question, right? Like, will you guys do some magic there or something? Not just for containers, but for distributing binaries. Um, it, it's hard to distribute things like C++ binaries because you kind of have to rely on the system C++ runtime. And what you'd like to have is distributable runtimes. Like they can, it, but the like lib standard C++ is only buildable with GCC. And it, it's a pain to extract like the distributable pieces of the Intel compiler. It would be nice, and maybe maybe I just don't know, but it would be nice if there were separate packages for the runtimes so that you could have a clear dependency on those things. But right now, there's a lot of mystery think, to what the are. compiler will link with. I think there are, and I think there are the same thing is true with uh, the CUDA runtime, for example. So CUDA, yeah, CUDA has, I think, a runtime package, yes. Is, separate, I, I, I thought, yeah. yeah, that's separate. I, I don't think ICC is the same way. So, yeah, the, you know, for, they, they have figured this out. That used to be when I was at Intel, Intel, they had a way to do that. They have figured this out at Compute Canada, where they, they build software with Intel compilers and then throw it on a CVMFS file system that anyone can mount. And they only include the runtime things in there. So there's a way to do it. For Yeah, well, Intel depends on GCC for its standard C++ runtime, which is a whole other nice build mess because you have to figure out, you know, how to make the C++ runtime consistent across your stack. And so that's that's a build tool problem. But yeah, you can you can do it. You can take lib standard C++ out of GCC and just ship it or ship an installation of GCC. Mm -hmm. um, I think for containers, shipping the installation of, well, I mean, this is not typically something that you would bind mount though. So like, I, I don't know that that's, uh, the, the place where it would come up is if you tried to bind mount something that used a different lib standard C++ on the host than in the container. Okay. And so I'm, I think that I, I was about to ask if we can agree on a, on a standard recipe file, like is it a Docker file, the builder spec or builder spec or a singularity build recipe file format? But since we now talked about how to make like pre-built steps and how to bind mount from the host, do you do you guys think we cannot agree on something like again Dockerfire, for instance, with this extended front end, we can do a lot of crazy things that uh, we might want to do for HPC specific builds, right? Well, uh, considering that. Um... For example, build could adds a lot of nice stuff to Docker and Docker file, but I think the great disadvantage of the Docker file is that it loses readability really, really fast. So um, if you start packaging uh, commands or um, results of commands into a single layer, then you have one run command with dozens and dozens of lines, which is really hard to read. Then um, build kit adds those uh, parameters to the run command, like uh, mount for secrets and, and volumes and stuff, and it, it loses readability again. So although I'm working with the Docker file on a daily basis and, uh, and it does work, I must admit that I don't really love them because um, it's really hard to write readable Docker files. But we can talk, we can ask Kenneth and Todd if they ever saw a file that's readable and lovable, I guess. So I think. It's, 
I mean, there is some pain if it's, it's, it's complex, right? So there is some complexity that needs to be written down in recipes. So I'm not sure if it can ever be super no, easy. No, that's, the, that's the whole issue. These things are complex. If you're doing anything beyond the configure, make, make, install, it, it's going to be messy. Or you're, you're going to be stuck in a language like both Spark and EasyBuild are implemented in Python. If you don't know Python, then yeah, you're again looking at something you don't know enough about to, to make sense of. Um, yeah, and if you don't know Docker about, files, it's the same story. So I don't think there's a single. Some people would have to give up something for maybe no no real benefit, other than everybody's using the same thing. I I don't see that happening. But isn't I will say one one thing. Well, this is yeah, go ahead. Sorry. No, no, no. Sorry. Go ahead. I'm. I I agree with Kenneth. I don't think you're going to come up. I don't think shell is like, for some reason, a better build language than something else. Like, I, I don't think there's like a universal build recipe. And, and I mean, you know, in SPAC, we have a lot of conventions in the package files that are useful for builders that you can't translate to shell. So like we might query, you know, a dependency library for its libraries or something through the Python interface, or we might test something in the Python interface and then do something based on it. And that doesn't really translate to, to shell. And I don't, I mean, I think the benefits of compiling it down there, if, if there's bugs in the, you know, the translation process, it's going to be just as painful to figure out what the heck went wrong with translation um, as it would be to just debug the build in the language that it was written in. So I'm kind of hesitant to say that we should have a universal format. Uh, on the singularity front, I mean, the, the original reason we have a different uh, lingo is simply because um, first versions of singularity were written by me, and I'm really suck at dealing with parsing things in C. And the Docker file was uh, is a very is a mess to to parse and deal with. So uh, um, so I came up with something that was much more simple simpler for me to parse, and also easier in my opinion in terms of encapsulating you know, different types of, of methodologies kind of around the idea of shell script scriptlets that RPM uses. Uh, I'm, I'm not committed to any one uh, or any kind. And I think from, again, the singularity perspective, it's really about, you know, what is the community using? Uh, we, we can integrate with Builda. We can integrate with Docker. We can integrate with IMG. Doesn't matter to us, right? Whatever people want to use is fine. Um, if at some point people stop using and stop finding value in the format that we have, we, we simply will stop maintaining it. Uh, so just very pragmatic and simple approach. So one thing, one thing that would help with the container formats is, uh, I mean, so one one problem we run into is people keep asking us if we could have like a layer per spec package or something like that. And it, it seems really appealing because we could actually map the layers to packages and, and you'd get better caching effects. Um, but there's a layer limit on the Docker format, and it's way too small for mapping to any package manager. So I mean, I, that that might be a useful standard because then you know your package manager can do something to install one package, and you know that that could be a layer in your Docker file. That could be one run, um, and then you know it would at least map to the caching, and you could you could understand things in pieces. But yeah, that, that's not really related to the recipe format. Yeah. But I think I'm amongst yeah. those those guys who ask you this. <laughs> you yeah. are one of those guys who ask me many things about what the Docker file <laughs> can look like. Yeah, I mean, the, the, isn't the question can we can we create building blocks that we can reuse? I mean, the same way as you guys, you you uh, it's say install Gromax and then Easy Build and Spec and HPC CM will go off and and do some backend stuff to create those those uh, software packages. Can we just agree on a building block that is beneath this to create those and, and share our outcomes of the command install something? You, you mean like Has a, that a, a practice, really? Go ahead. Do, do you mean like a common library underneath all these tools that does the actual installations or? Or a common artifact. I mean, I talked to all of you, I think, about like having a Docker file that rolls, that is super huge, of course, but rolls out everything that's done by the installation process instead of just shelling out and doing configure, make, install, and setting environment variables. What, what, what would you do with, do with it? I mean, this is going to be a thousand line Docker file that you, you cannot tell up, up or down from. But if it's a multi stage file that has for each 
dependency, it has a, a different stage, then you can at least say, I want this library to be installed differently, and you just change the Docker file. Yeah, but you should exist that. as proof for something that you can do with this, because I don't think you want a massive Docker file. No, then, I want to throw this. Uh, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. So uh, this is exactly what HPCM does as an open source tool. And the aspiration when we started was uh, to be able to say, hey, here are a bunch of building blocks. It's all open source. Anybody can write these. Anybody can contribute a better version of this building block. And if some grad student wants to prove herself and say, hey, look at mine. It's better than yours. You should use this. Then they can put in a pull request. We've gotten a little bit of feedback from different users and uh, making suggestions for uh, how to improve existing building blocks. But I wouldn't say that that's really caught on. I don't think that you want to have something that's flat. I think you want something that's factored uh, according to each of the different kinds of building blocks that you could want. Uh, I'm totally fine with letting, you know, having there being in different instances of how you express that and how that's used in whatever the different build systems are. Um, but I, I think having something that's appropriately packaged and factored in a way to like, what's the best way to do this? And even if your code is different than my code, let's at least agree on what that code is doing and the best way to do it and have conversations about that and have a forum for having conversations about that. And that's exactly what we sought to do with HPC. And maybe there's a better way to make that work. So one I'm seeing in, in, at work, and um, I must admit that I come from an entirely different background because um, I'm not dealing with uh, HPC. I'm dealing with uh, developers and uh, creating code. So we have uh, like, around 50 different development teams working on different projects in different languages with different tools. And what we are seeing right now is that um, they don't want to rely on the big fat image with all the tools packed in because if it's something missing, they need to rebuild. If something is outdated, they need to rebuild, which all takes time and someone needs to take, needs to take care of this. Um, what we see is that um, the whole build process, so from build over test uh, to package to deploy, is uh, split into different steps, and each step is run on a different smaller image. So, for example, you have one image that is responsible for the build process, sort of the compile process of your software. The next one is responsible for um, for packaging it, for example, in a Docker image. On and the next one is then um, responsible for deploying it to a, to a test environment, and then another one for for testing. Uh, your artifact in the environment. Um, so you have some glue code around this, which again is is standardized, let, let's say in, in a GitLab YAML file, for example. Maybe that is something that uh, helps us to, to get away from this uh, big fat Docker file, at least in, in my line of work. I guess the Docker file has specific semantics associated with it, though, like in terms of how the layering is set up and so on. So like I, in GitLab, YAML doesn't really specify that. So I think there would need to be something in between if we wanted to do what you're suggesting. I, th I don't think it's a bad idea. I'm, I'm not saying that um, the outcome of, um, of a pipeline that you have in a, in a GitLab CI YAML file is one image. I'm just saying that maybe you have to do different things at different yeah. at different steps. And for example, uh, we operate on on source code and um, uh, create artifacts from that. So you actually operate on a directory of just files, just data, and you apply different things on that. And that's what, yep. what that is what the pipeline does. Okay, guys. We have a topic that. Uh... Go ahead, CJ. Okay, I was just gonna say I think we have a topic that's going in the Slack channel here that others may be interested in. <laughs> the Slack channel or the chat, the Chime channel, or I don't know. The Chime channel, yeah, whatever it is. <laughs> okay, yeah. So go we have ahead. all the media. Well, I guess one of the things that I've seen people running into is, hey. Uh, and, and I'll, I'll cite uh, the guys at Summit, for example. Um, you don't want Joe user, even as a developer, on a big system to be able to have root privileges. And you do want them to be able to do their own containers. And so how is it that you let them build containers? Um, and uh, so you know, without the privileges. 
one answer has been you create a build server and go to do that. And uh, Greg and company, I think you're doing some work in that area. Um, and uh, another, though, is to use more modern kernels with user namespaces um, to be able to not need that privilege. So I kind of wanted to ask, what are the gaps uh, that we would need to close, or you know, what uh, rails do we need to grease to address that as a usability problem so that more people can um, build their own containers without privilege? Well, there are two ways. I could just right? real quick, real quick, just want to add to what CJ said because those are two really great options. There's one more, and this is the one that a lot of larger organizations are moving towards, which is integration of CI/CD. Right, building those containers through that DevOps pipeline. Anyway, now that I've said that, Eduardo, go for it. Yeah, it's tied with the same that CJ said. You said is uh, if you are modern enough to use user namespace, use them. But as in the Slack channel, people are saying, and, and Kenneth said, we are building edge hardware, but it's still running CentOS 6, so we cannot talk about user namespaces here. But another way that I'm seeing um, some customers are running is you can now have CI, CD pipelines with Kubernetes leveraging Leerbeard or uh, this uh, Kata containers or Kubebeard, or there are like two or three projects that allow you to run these virtual machines containers, kind of like this weird hybrid. And if you don't have the username space, right? So you can use old school virtualization tools, but run them as containers in your Kubernetes cluster. And this removes the security concern because you're running just a virtual machine with your CI CD pipeline. So for it, also in the HPC world, I mean, we we did a big project out of ECP to to make it so that GitLab can do set UID CI jobs. So essentially, when you push to GitLab, the the CI jobs that result run as your user or as some service user you're authorized to run as. So if your team has like a project user that does their CI, and right now we do that on bare metal. So like we have a special runner that sets UID to whatever you want to whatever your user is in a trusted way with the GitLab server. But um, we'd really like to enable that to, to work just as well as the built-in Docker runner in GitLab. And so, you know, what we're looking at is using something like Podman, where, you know, you could just do an unprivileged build as your user or as whatever the team user is um, in those jobs. And so, you know, all you need for that is, is for the, the server to launch the jobs as, you know, some untrusted user. So, so maybe I can... Go Sorry, ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> So one thing that we have recently done is um, we are heavily relying on uh, GitLab CI and uh, we have added uh, a build kit sidecar to every runner. So they are uh, spawned whenever a job is, uh, is started um, on demand, they are thrown away afterwards. And they have a build kit sidecar, uh, which runs in unprivileged container and is still able to um, build say, um, almost everything that you'd want to do. So that is also one option instead of um, isolating on a lower level. And I've heard uh, cutter containers, which is a great option. There's also uh, Google Gvisor to isolate on an even lower level. Um, but I think on, on a high level to just run the build in an unprivileged way is, is a really important option because you don't rely on a, on a lower, lower level stack component that you need to, to add to your environment. Yeah, I agree. And to build from this, I mean, this whole unprivileged build functionality on our actual, you know, HPC systems is now a reality. It's not, it's not future. It's coming. I'm using Podman to build containers on my login nodes of an ARM system. Um, most people may or may not be familiar. I kind of help procure a whole several thousand ARM nodes, and you know, my laptop. Doesn't look like an ARM node. So we're using Podman to do uh, unprivileged builds and then using Singularity to run them uh, at, at scale. So this is a reality. And as Todd mentioned, I think the next step in this is being able to use uh, CI CD runners and plugging that in and interacting directly with, with say, you know, Podman or build it directly. So I, I think we're really close to that. I think that's going to be a, a reality here soon. We already have app teams who are building their ML apps with um, with the GitLab pipeline in LC, and they're basically just they're doing Podman builds with it, sort of manually from the runners. And the, the final output of the pipeline is is the set of containers they use for their workflow. Then they go and run it through Flux. 
Um, Flux is a little more thing, not the whatever the Facebook Flux thing is. But like for CI/CD pipelines, you 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 need again to know what your architecture is and what your or what your target system is and what you want to build, right? Um, in you the do. Panel, like Theophilus says that. Yeah, you want to run it as as Andrew said as well on the login node. Maybe you want to log in and then you want to do your your own build. So that's uh, not something that you can easily do with um, yeah, with the CI/CD pipeline, right? So I think this will still well, be. Well, so actually, with with ours, you can. So we we tag our runners, and so each every runner on, at our site is tagged based on what the the cluster name, the arch spec name of the architecture. So that, that's what the you know the library that Kenneth was talking about earlier. We wrote that for partially this reason. We wanted to be able to say, run this on a Skylake node and build for Skylake. And so we okay. tag the runners. And, and then so the, the pipeline works. So we can just and we can build a SPAC matrix of builds that says, build all these packages with these compilers for these targets, and it will farm them out to runners accordingly. But for this, your, your source code needs to be in the Git and needs to be committed to Git, right? Which is a good thing as well, uh, of course. But uh, if you if you just want to do something fast and uh, yeah and i yeah and, and i know okay you should have everything in git but if you just want to fool around if you want to develop something live in a, in the live session then you don't want to commit everything to git maybe um so sure like for for like a shell script that you run yes but it's not we're, we're not doing ci cd pipelines necessarily from the source repo for the project that's being built we're doing we're doing ci cd repos or um pipelines from SPAC. And so basically you you define a SPAC environment that says I want these 10 packages. It goes and figures out their dependencies and farms them all, all the builds for those out to jobs. And so yeah, I mean your your environment, the SPAC.yaml file needs to be in CI C D. Um, but you're you can still play around with with code. Um, you know, I guess yes, in a Git repo. You do you do have to push to the Git repo, which is not that big of a step in my opinion. Yeah. The idea is you can use the exact same tools for doing it either way. And I think that's an important notion, yeah. right? If, if you want to go bring in and build some random container on a login node, go do that. If you want to plug it in with a, with a you know, uh, CI CD pipeline, even better, right? And that should yeah. be functionally equivalent. And the runners themselves are running on the login nodes or they're farming out to batch jobs on the systems. And so it's basically yeah. using the HPC system we already have deployed to do the CI CD. It's not quite as versatile as like a cloud, but we'd like to get there. It's certainly a step in the right direction. Yeah, we're we're moving that way. And I mean, you know, the other DOE sites are moving towards GitLab as the, as the system for this as well because of all the work that we did to get the security straight for HPC systems. Um, I would say for unprivileged builds, getting back to what are the obstacles, like CJ was saying, um, Podman unprivileged builds uh, don't tend to work that well on NFS volumes if you're using sub UIDs and sub GIDs. And so that is the workspace that most of our users have as their home directory. So if, and, you know, even our workspace directories, like if you, um, if you, if, if the runner spawns, the workspace directory is typically set to like a, you know, large NFS volume that's not backed up. Um, but Podman doesn't run well there. So we're looking at using Fuse or something like that to get a, a file system in place that would actually support the um, the unprivileged builds. I really wish, though, that it did not matter what file system I was building on, because um, it's nice to be able to choose um, where you do this work. And, and we don't really have the flexibility we need right now with, with the way that Podman well, works. The simple solution is to tell NFS to build in Linux capabilities, right? <laughs> Uh, that would solve. So I don't, I don't. So our problem has historically been that the NFS mount does not understand the sub UIDs and sub GIDs that are used by the unprivileged builds. If you define the mappings, yeah. So, and and we don't. If if you're just producing one container artifact, like you don't really care about those. Like you, you, if the artifact is owned entirely by, I, I guess I still think we need some user like nobody, right? That yeah. you have you have root. You have, um, you know, root is the universal user because the UID is zero everywhere. And so root containers are very easy to distribute because you can hand them to someone and they'll understand what the UID means. You need some other user that is unprivileged, that is like nobody that has UID, I don't know, one, and that you could hand to someone and it says, you know, this is not a special file. This is not something that implies privilege on the OS where it runs. This is just something that's owned by whoever the heck runs the container. 
And right now there's nothing like that. Yeah, I wanted to make a remark along those lines. I feel like, um, you know, this is maybe an artifact of we're trying to use the normal kind of packaging distribution tools that we've grown up with, and they're really not designed for container build use cases, but we're optimized for that, let's say. And I feel like we need we need something for these use cases where, like, we really just want it to, whoever's going to run it should have those rights. And there's no... You don't even need privileges. It's either in there or not, you know, is almost what you, is, is all that you care about. And, um, you know, maybe there's there's time for another, you know, we're getting close where we need a different kind of approach for building these containers, you know, a different packaging solution that's really designed around the container use case. Well, I was going to, I was going to say that earlier when, when CJ was talking about building blocks, I, I mean, and Christian was talking about building blocks for, with container recipes. Container recipes aren't building blocks. There's already a tool out there for building blocks. It's called a freaking package manager. The only reason that your container is easy to build things in is because there's a package manager in it and you install things with the package manager. So like, I, I think a lot more work needs to be done on the package manager side to support that and not necessarily with the container image format or anything else. Which, and, and beware that package managers, managers can often do way overkill in terms of uh, bringing way more into the container than you really want, unless you do also use a multi-stage build to clean out all the cross that you really didn't need. And that's so better, can it present not clear to whether you can either. tune the package manager enough to really minimize that to be really effective, because I think you'll still need all the cross you need for building that you don't need for running. And so you're still going to want a second stage there. So can it already be presented SPAC containerize, which generates a multi-stage build that does SPAC garbage collect that removes all the unneeded build dependencies from the final artifact. So we already do that. And it strips the binaries. Okay, so at the end of the runtime piece, I ask if we, if we are going to talk about runtimes next time. I think it's pretty sure that we will talk about build next time. That's um, something that... Not gone away. <laughs> it's not going to go away. So for any, I mean, it's a virtual event. So like basically we can run for forever, but we shouldn't maybe. So any <laughs> closing thought, any like comment that you guys want to get off your chest before we, we uh, call it a day or I call it a day at least. You should do that experiment where you run forever and see how long your panelists stay. <laughs> <laughs> No, uh, something I really want everyone to take back home from this is what Todd just said, because this it has been in my mind for a long time, is that we should really start differentiating what the package manager has to do and what the container has to do at build time. Like con the container and container builds are not just to rewrite another RPM dev package manager, right? That's why we have those. And now we have a SPAC in ECBO to do a more SPC-like package management. We should really start focusing on what do we need to contain, like to write in our image, and what do we need from SPAC and from ECBO. Like we should really start uh, moving the conversation in that direction, right? Like what do, we, what do I need from the container and what do I need from the package manager? And start splitting out those conversations. Yeah. I'll just point out that you'll run into problems there because package managers are actually pretty hard to write. So there's, and there's, there's a whole, it is a black art that not many people are well acquainted with. And, and I think that like, there's going to have to, that that's going to have to get to be more common knowledge. It's, it's pretty interesting once you get down in there that just like so many of these things that are, that are pretty freaking sophisticated have built up over the years in like yum and APT and all these systems. And uh, you know, I don't know. I think I think that's where some of this stuff has to live. If you're going to start talking about understanding compatibility between packages, synchronizing versions, doing things that really do require solves, um, you know, that's that's hard. But I, I don't want to drop another bomb, but maybe just to to get you guys uh, totally enraged, like like the package manager also needs to update. The package manager also needs to make sure that the system packages are up to date and so on. But isn't that a little bit relaxed or like a little bit, maybe a lot relaxed in the container? I mean, you don't need to update a container, right? You don't need to you, you build it once and then you never look at it again. Only if you sure, don't want you to trust the container. the container, you don't need to update it. That's true. Yeah, yeah, and if you need to update it, you build a new one, right? So, I mean. 
So I have, I have the same recipe, hopefully. Both, both build and update require dependency resolution, right? And, and so they're both, they're both hard. That's true. Right? That's the same problem. And so if you build it again or you update again, it's the same problem. It's just that if you build it again, you're saying, I don't care about what was there before. I'm not even going to try to do something like what the user already had. Um, and if you if you think about updating, it's basically saying, given this environment, give me a you know better or newer version of it. And, and there's all sorts of interesting problems that are not solved there either. Uh, okay, so guys, thank you. We will have this discussion, like uh, yeah, continuing this discussion next year, and we will have tomorrow. We will have um, distribute and orchestrate, so it's going to be a fun one as well. But yeah, thanks everyone for joining this first day. I think work quite well so i'm pretty happy with my setup so fingers crossed for tomorrow and yeah see you guys tomorrow thanks so much thanks bye. for presenting for me Kenneth. thanks bye bye thanks a lot everyone bye